Um, we have the privilege today to have as our orator Dr. Claire Gerarda. Um, in the Queen's Birthday Honours of 2000, she was awarded an MBE for services to med medicine and drug misusers. In today's Birthday Honours, she's been made a Dane Commander of the Order of the British Empire, a DBE. <laughs> So many, many congratulations, and we are honoured uh, to be your first speaking engagement as a Dane. <laughs> By way of introduction, I will read from her citation in today's honours list. Um, Dr. Gerarda's career as a GP and psychiatrist spans 30 years. She remains a senior partner at the Hurley Group practice, which began as a single practice in Lambeth, and has now expanded to 14 sites. It provides primary care, including urgent care on a large scale, uh, a model now promoted by NHS England. Her partnership created eConsult, a digital platform for patients to consult at the most appropriate time, place and person to which 26 million patients now have access. At the Department of Health between 1996 and 2004, she transformed the care of drug users by a major shift from hospital to GP-led treatment and provided outstanding leadership and groundbreaking work in the field of substance misuse and mental health. She was the first woman chair of the Royal College of GPs in 50 years. She led the profession through the 2012 NHS Act. In 2008, and eight, she developed the Practitioner Health Programme, a mental health service for doctors and dentists, which in 2018 won the BMJ Mental Health Team of the Year. In 2018, she joined the GMC review on uh, gross neglect for the, the Department of Health Gender Pay Gap Review and the Home Office Special Advisory Group uh, on the Cannabis Based Medicines Expert Panel. Uh, in 2019, she was appointed a co chair of the NHS Assembly, which advises the joint boards on the delivery of the NHS long term plan. And she's also a non-executive director of University College London Hospital. Phew, <laughs> that, that is some list of achievements. Um, but I'd like to add uh, a couple to that. Um, she chairs the charity Doctor in Distress, which aims to reduce suicides in doctors and other healthcare workers. Uh, and she's currently also leading a pilot support service in South London for problem gamblers. On a personal level, um, her dynamic leadership of the RCGP resulted in me rejoining after I'd resigned in anger over their previous lack of voice in very turbulent times for my profession. Um, Claire has dual Maltese and British citizenship. Her father, like my father-in-law, qualified in Malta before moving to England to become single-handed GPs. And she tells me she's uh, just about to receive a phone call from the Prime Minister of Malta because of her uh, recent award. So our orator today is going to be reflecting on how the COVID crisis has affected the provision of healthcare, particularly from a GP perspective. Ladies and gentlemen, although I'm not quite sure if I'm allowed to use the title yet, Dame Claire Gerardo. Thank you so much. I think you are allowed to use it now, actually. Uh, I'll just switch this off because otherwise it will make noise. And thank you so much. And um, this is my first outing as a Dame. I've got a slight hangover, which you can probably forgive me for. Uh, and it is an absolute pleasure to be here with you live as well as the remote audience i have to say that being able to see the bottom half of people is quite extraordinary uh, in this world and it does make a big difference and yes i'm going to talk about my profession i'm going to look backwards as well as forward and about how covid has impacted on this and it's such an honor to be here and thank you very much for mentioning doctors in distress it's a charity that i started uh, i took over in may of this year aimed to not just reducing the stigma around mental illness on this World Mental Health Day, but also around reducing the risk of suicide uh, amongst health professionals. And if this week hadn't been amazing enough, I launched my book called Beneath the White Coat, Doctors, Their Minds and Mental Health, 
yesterday, or the day before yesterday, and all proceeds for this book will be going to the charity Doctors in Distress. And if you get there early, you can actually get a discount if you go onto uh, the website practitionerhealth.nhs.uk or on the Doctors in Distress website. And it tells a lot about me as well as some uh, work around doctors and doctors' mental illness, and there's some spectacular chapters. But let me start. So, as if I need to tell you, I'm talking to you in the midst of the second wave of the pandemic. As GPs are winding up for a busy winter, having only just left behind a traumatic spring and summer. And despite the Daily Mail headlines in September, general practice has been open and working throughout. It has never shut. In fact, it is busier than ever, dealing with our patients' concerns, supporting them during this crisis, and managing business as usual alongside COVID-19. We have not let our patients down, but we would expect nothing else from our profession, as GPs have always risen to the challenge, whatever is presented to us. GPs, since the dawn of the NHS, have provided safe, accessible and patient-centred care. And this is the job which I have worked in now for more than 30 years. And as I approach the end of my career, I can truly say that it has been the most interesting, challenging, at times deeply infuriating, but fundamentally the best job in the world. And despite the problems we face of shortages and underfunding and overwork, I believe there has never been a more exciting time to be a GP. But I'm not naive. I know the problems we're facing. After all, how can I not be aware of them, given, as you've heard, I've been heading up a confidential service for doctors and dentists with mental illness for now more than a decade. I'm only too aware of the disillusionment, the high rates of depression and burnout amongst all doctors, and specifically the problems of my own specialty, general practice. Even before COVID, the biggest crisis we were facing was the mental health of doctors. And this is only going to get worse as doctors have to deal with their own personal losses and anxieties, as well as those of their patients. I'm also all too aware that much needs to be done if the next generation of doctors are able to look back as I am 30 years, 30 years on with enthusiasm and without having sacrificed too much of themselves or their lives in the process. So indulge me as I talk predominantly from my own experience about the past and look forward into the future. After all, it's important to look back as if one never does look back, it's impossible to see how much has changed and how much more needs to be done. So bear with me. On the 17th of February 1991, I arrived at my new practice, fresh-faced and bushy-tailed. In fact, that was far from the truth. I was in my first trimester of my second pregnancy, despite my partners telling me at the interview not to get pregnant. <laughs> And alongside preparing for my new job, I'd spent the morning vomiting and feeling dreadful. But I was so excited. This was my dream job, which I'd competed against with 40 or so other applicants to get. It was the practice where I was also registered as a patient. I applied for the position which had been make vacant through my own GP, Lady Rose Levine. She would boom out over the tannoy to call her patients from her waiting room, from the waiting room. Claire Gerarda to Lady Rose in room three, she would say. And you could almost hear her voice in my own kitchen, which was in a flat in a street just behind the surgery. The surgery was, and still is, located on the bottom two storeys of an unprepossessing 17-storey block of flats. Built in the 1960s, it was one of three high-rise prefabricated blocks called Ebenezer House, Fairford House and Hurley House. And rather oddly, the Hurley Clinic was not to be found in Hurley House, but in Ebenezer House, something which confused me then and continues to confuse people even today. Now I was to get to know those flats like the back of my hands and I would see the residents, my patients, 
not just in the consulting room, but as I lived close by, also in the local shops, pubs, restaurants, and in the playground, as my children went to the same schools. I truly was, and still am, the local doctor, living, working, and playing in the same spaces as my patients. I chose this practice, not just because it was close to my home, but because it was so progressive. It had a reputation for caring for patients no one else wanted. The local intravenous drug addicts, which of which in, the, in those days there were plenty. The alcoholics in the rehabilitation unit just a few streets away. The ever growing number of HIV positive men who others were fearful of looking after. Or the homeless who resided by night in the local DOS house and by day in the streets close by. It was also a very stable partnership, whereas with a good marriage, the partners stay together during the bad as well as the good times, in sickness and in health, with doctors only leaving through retirement or sadly through death. So on that day, February 1991, as I moved from being patient to partner, I began a relationship with the practice which exists today, three decades on, and I'm still in the same room as Lady Rose Levine was and some of the patients are still the same. Mm -hmm. I also became, as with many thousands of GP colleagues across the UK, someone concerned not just with the health and well-being of my patients, but intimately involved with my community, trying to solve the problems I was seeing in the consulting room by effecting change outside it. And then in the tradition of generations of GPs, I became the parish doctor an archetype dating back to the licensed surgeons apothecaries of the early 19th centuries. And then in the tradition of Hippocrates, I cared for the entire patient, not just bits of them. Medicine as a single unit, not broken up into fragments, treating the whole person as a whole individual. Now, just before I started in general practice, I read the seminal work by Dr. John Fry, some of you too might have read his work. He was a GP in Beckenham in South London, not very far away from where I lived and worked. And he was a giant of our profession. He was a leading reformer in general practice and one of the founding fathers of the Royal College of GPs, being its chair and serving on its council for more than 30 years. He did a lot to raise the standards in general practice through his service on numerous committees and through his writing. He challenged British general practice on issues such as overprescribing, failures of communication, and the poor standard of patient records. His book on common diseases was an indispensable must for all GPs and was found on every single GP's consulting room bookshelf. Long before computers, if you wanted to know, for example, the prevalence of diabetes, you consulted Fry's book. He was an evidence-based practitioner before evidence-based practice existed. His published observations from his own surgery, because he used his own practice, drew conclusions which changed practice forever. For example, he helped to debunk the whole fashion of tonsillectomy, demonstrating a 20-fold difference in tonsillectomy rates between richer and poorer communities, with richer children having a much higher rate and poorer children. He started his career in general practice in 1947, only one year after the start of the NHS, and ended it in 1991, the year I started mine. And I had the honour of meeting him just the year before he died. His monograph, General Practice and Primary Healthcare from the 1940s to the 1980s, gave a detailed account of what he'd experienced during his professional life. And here are some of the things that he experienced in those years. The introduction of compulsory training for GPs, replacing the hit and miss training he had to endure. The establishment of the Royal College of GPs, which by his retirement was now 30 years old and was raising standards in general practice. 
He saw the introduction of the MRCGP examination. And whilst for years it was only the elite sat it, as it wasn't compulsory, it nevertheless set a standard in general practice that was hitherto absent. He saw the setting up of the RCGP Research and Surveillance Centre, which has supported world changing studies like the tracking of the safety of the contraceptive pill, amazing studies, but also tracking flu epidemics. How relevant is that more than today? He saw the start of budgets being allocated to practices so they could better adapt to the needs of their services, of their patients. And he saw the beginning of purpose built health centres which replaced what was in, which replaced what was around in those days, which was likely in my father's day, GPs consulting from their own home. If you're lucky in a converted house, or if you're unlucky, like with my father, where the, the living room doubled up as the patient's waiting room by day and the dining room as his consulting room. And he also saw the start of salaried partners, meaning that at last doctors had a choice whether or not to enter, enter partnership if they wanted to have more flexibility over their professional lives. So as said, his career ended where mine started. And there were many, still many more advances that were needed to be made. I started with the unpopular 99, 1991 UGP contract, which is probably what you were referring to, <laughs> which is an amazing new contract where whole swathes of GPs actually sent their registration letter ahead of the contract being introduced. Many more left the college. But despite GP's protestations at the time, it actually brought in some real change. It brought in payment against targets and activity. And just as unpopular, I saw the introduction of GP fund holding, which despite its early problems, did improve services for patients. I've seen the computerization of medical records and electronic prescribing, which has made patient care infinitely safer whereas people don't have to decipher illegible GP handwriting. My father's handwriting was so illegible that I think actually he caused more deaths through it than through any other way. He, I've seen the replacing of the antiquated old Lloyd George records, those rather optimistic brown envelopes where a patient's entire medical record could be placed. Digital care now means that the entire patient journey from registration to discharge with hospital treatment in between can be done remotely. But there have been other monumental changes in my career. The setting up of DARSI centres, large 50,000 population group practices co-located with other services, general practitioners with special clinical interest, independent nurse prescribing. In 2004, the new GP contract and with it the quality and outcome framework. GP run urgent care centres and compulsory MRCGP. When I started, 40% of GPs were like my father in single or double handed practices. We now have the modern era where practices work across each other, across organisations and with different models of care. Over the years, some of my patients have grown old with me, whilst others have come and gone. I have borne witness to their joy, pain, suffering, life and death. Their problems have changed though. In the early days, I was more likely to see measles than ME. Diabetes, depression, obesity and chronic disease management have now replaced the older diseases and the acute infections of years ago. The professionalisation of practice management. When I started, management as it was, was the doctor's wife managing the books and answering the phone. Now we have well-trained, highly competent managerial and administrative staff able to control large budgets and manage complex organisations. And these are only some of the few changes which have come in over the last 30 years since I've been a GP. And during this time that I've been a GP, I believe that general practice has moved from its cottage industry past through the industrial revolution, which was by the end of Fry's day, day to its digital present. But before I become too optimistic, across all generations, general practice has been beset with problems and it still is. And if anything, some are getting worse. 
I mentioned I was one of 40 applicants. Now it's hard to get one applicant for 40 posts. It's hard to retain doctors and we're losing many to early retirement. Our workload has grown exponentially and we've become victims of our own success. We do more to a greater level of complexity and specialism than most GPs in the world. And as such, more is sent in our way, a vicious circle. Whilst the essence of general practice, which must be continuous medical care to the whole individual remains our goal, increasing marketization and new players on the field have put obstacles in the way of providing this. And on top of this, there is also the huge weight of expectation laid on us by politicians and policymakers, for all doctors, but especially I would attest for GPs, as we're seen both as a saviour and the scapegoat of the NHS, sometimes on the same day. Patients and politicians expect far too much from us. But somehow we can magically make good the problems of chronic underfunding. That we can sprinkle fairy dust and make good the faults of the wider NHS and social care. That we alone can solve the fault lines in the welfare state. We're also expected to devote our lives to the service of our patients. A paper written in The Lancet in 1950 wrote that general practice demands from the individual long hours, hard work, and the sacrifice of much of his home life. The author went on to say that he, there were always he's in those days, the GP, will need good health and physique to stay the course. It ended, and the woman he marries must be prepared to share the burden and sacrifice. So no wonder GPs had such high divorce rates. Another listed the attributes expected from the average GP, which included inexhaustible tact, wisdom, discretion, kindly and humane. And however pressed he is for time, each patient should be made to feel that his illness is of real concern to him. Now the responses of many of us, all doctors, not just GPs, to impossible challenges like this, is to do what we've been trained to do, to push ourselves even harder, to make even more sacrifices, risking burnout and mental illness. And no wonder that many of our profession have fallen by the wayside through exhaustion. But over the years, and from the last generation to the next, I think we also have a tendency to exaggerate our threats and not applaud our successes and an adaptability. One grandee of the college, and anyone from the college will recognise who this person is, but I'm not going to name, would announce at every single council meeting that I was at, the end of general practice is in sight. And he, sorry, I've gendered him now, but they're all he's in those days. He would be responding to a new government initiative, which he felt was eroding the essence of general practice, and that neither, neither general practice nor general practitioners could possibly survive the changes expected of them. Now, what he failed to realise, and many others who look back with rose-coloured spectacles, is that the next generation, which I was at the time, relished change, relished challenge, and not just survived each new revolution uh, of our profession, but thrived, as I would say I did. John Fry, when reflecting on the future of general practice, in his monograph wrote, our future is rooted in our past and is predictable from our present. The future of our profession is being shaped now, today, in the midst of this pandemic. Good things sometimes come out of plagues and can jumpstart changes in practice and society. Black death is a perfect example. And if we allow, good things will happen in general practice, but across medicine as a consequence of this plague. Already we've seen enormous changes and this will continue. Over these months, we've had to rapidly adapt to our changing environment 
and new ways of working. We've gone through decades of transformation in one short space of time. For example, in the space of a weekend back in March, we moved all 1 million consultations done face to face every day, collectively by GPs across England, 1 million to an online space delivered remotely through digital, telephone and video. How many of us back in March had heard of Zoom, Teams, Skype for Business this time last year or whenever? Let alone understand and how to use those varying platforms and systems that we've now had to rapidly learn. Now, most of us have added the phrase, you're on mute to our medical vernacular. Further, a year ago, 99% of our contacts with patients were face-to-face. -face. Few were done remotely, but 99% were face-to-face. -face. Yet for years, the profession has been arguing that 75% of the patients in our consulting room need not be seen by us. But determining which of those did need to be seen meant seeing them all. Now we have new ways of safely signposting patients and able to determine not just who needs to be seen, but the best person to see them, the degree of urgency that they need to be seen, by whom and by when, before the patient walks through. Whilst there needs to be a rebalancing, I predict that going forward, half of all consultations will start and finish online without the need for a face-to-face -face telephone or video consultation with us. And this will allow us more time with our patients more time to use it wisely, spending longer with the patients that need us. In recent months, we've had to adapt to almost a third of our staff being off sick, shielding or isolating, and the vast majority of the rest working from home. We've done this by improving patient flows and skill mix and allowing staff to work at the top of their license, using their skills much more effectively. A simple example, allowing healthcare assistants to be able to administer insulin, which they weren't allowed to in the past. COVID has changed how we organize ourselves within and across practices. Practices have had to rapidly merge with others, with some becoming hot sites, seeing only COVID or acute infections, whilst others remaining open for all other patients. This has necessitated us sharing staff, co-locating a staff with other practices, moving practices onto a single site, pooling expertise and bringing in new practitioners to help us. When I was in general practice, we didn't know any of the doctors up the road, even if they were just 20 yards away. And we've done this whilst continuing to deal with the vast majority of care patients have needed. But more change will happen. I predict that the GP of the future will no longer be tucked in their consulting room seeing patients alone. Instead, they will use their skills to be the conductor of a large team, an orchestra of nurses, pharmacists, physician associates, social prescribers, also other medical specialists, psychiatrists, elderly care doctors and general physicians, bringing about true integrated care, which given our ability to deal with a whole patient, we will lead. I predict Patients will be registered within a network, not with a practice. But with proper systems, GPs will still be able to have their own personal list. With a patient able to choose continuity, my GP, over access, next available appointment. In the future, the idea of one's practice, doing everything, be something of the past and seem as antiquated as with the isolated small practices of my day, where no one met anyone at all other than at the odd evening training event. Instead, we will see services organised across a network with digital driving better patient care and service segmentation, allowing for the separation of acute care and chronic disease management for longer and shorter appointments, multidisciplinary working and integrated care. The next generation's future will be one where the relationships between doctors and patients will be more equal one in which patients are more involved and more responsible for their own health. Genomics will take off, heralding the era of truly personalized medicine. 
The future GP will have to learn how to decipher and translate this information for their parents, patients and their parents. Something we, with our ability to manage risk, deal with uncertainty and care for our patients holistically are skilled at. The doctor of the future will also have a different relationship with themselves and their work. We teach doctors to make the patient their first concern. And indeed, this is first on the General Medical Council's list of the duties of a doctor. And further, the Geneva Declaration, which doctors now sign up to when they enter the profession, begins with a solemn pledge to consecrate my life to the service of humanity. Or to quote an Archbishop of Canterbury in the late 1940s, where he said that a GP must have the passion for, po for personal vocation and devotion. Now, of course, doctors should always act honestly, compassionately and avoid conflicts of interest. But I ask, is it reasonable to ask any doctor to consecrate their life to the service of humanity? It's a very big ask. And I believe that the age of self-sacrifice will now end and the doctors of the future will have a more realistic view of their own limits. Service, not sacrifice, will be the driving force. So as I come to the end, to summarise, I believe 30 years from now, our profession will look, feel and will be delivered differently from what it is today. Doctors of today will shape their future, just as I have shaped mine. There will be bad times, of course. How can one be so close to death, dying and disability without some psychological pain rubbing off? But doctors today are already more honest about their needs for a healthier work-life balance. They are better trained, more able to deal with the complexities in the consulting room than I was. They will have digital and social media to exploit for the betterment of patient care. And I believe their future will build on the best of the present. And as I said, there has never been a more exciting time to be a GP. Thank you. Thank you, Zoom. Thank you, Zoom. There's somebody there that says it's a bit wet outside my garden, but no one heard. Yeah, I went to try and check. Oh, oh, they're not there. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Claire. That was uh, an amazing synopsis, I think, of, of general practice. My career is an exact um, image of yours. And um, I, I love the optimism for the future and the fact that over the years, People have always been saying this is the end of primary care as we know it. Um, I'm also delighted that you were not on mute. Now, there is the opportunity for people to uh, ask questions. Uh, Claire, perhaps if you'd like sure, to come back you. to the microphone, if anybody asks questions from the floor, if you'd like to repeat them so that people on Zoom can, um, can hear them. Fine. Uh, now, I do have one to be starting on with, off with, which um, is from one it says of our videos have been disabled. Is this intentional? Mm -hmm. But they oh, haven't no, been. That one okay, all right then. Yeah. <laughs> um, they haven't asked any questions on there that I can see. No. They need to start asking now, I think. This is a practical question from a, from a GP friend of mine. Um, you're very much involved in e consult. Mm -hmm. um, how do you promote it in practice? And how do you encourage patients to use it? That's a very good question. We've gone, and I don't know the exact figures, but this time last year from about you four... You may just need to repeat that just in case. Oh, did you all hear the question? The question was about e-consult, and I do have a conflict of interest here because e-consult is... Uh, we, I'm a shareholder and on the non I'm a non-executive on the board. Saying that, if I just say a few words about e-consult, and GPs will understand this, as will, I think, other doctors. It was a horrible rainy day. We were just about to go. We had, always used to have our team meeting on a Monday morning before we started morning surgery. So we'd always start at 7.30 in the morning, go down and start morning surgery at 8.30. And we were all moaning as GPs are wanting to moan. And I think it was me, but one of us said, oh God, wouldn't it be great if we knew what the patient wanted before they came through the door? And then we'd be able to allocate them at the right time. And we said, and at the time, all the digital was being focused on wearables. 
so it was on wearables how to take your pulse your blood pressure and we said all of that is nonsense for general practice because it just adds work to us and what we need and that was a journey that started about eight years ago and, and we've been building it and building and building it. this time last year we were doing across the practices that have e-consult i think about four thousand uh, a month i think there's now something like forty thousand a day so it has been accelerating which of course COVID has done that at the beginning it wasn't patients that was the problem it was gps and for rightly for reasons but they were reluctant because they said we'll miss the oh by the way doctor as they walk out the sort of the door or we would miss non-verbal cues i personally miss face-to-face -face patients it is not a replacement for face-to-face -face contact with a patient but it does help us to start to stream to start to, to understand and, and work out our workload and you can actually pick up non-verbal cues and you can actually pick up the oh by the way doctor but it's harder but you can pick it up so the problem in the early days was the doctors as it sort of always is really because i think we've doctors on the whole are reluctant to change their habits patients love it because it means uh, they can they can tell us what's wrong with them in their own words and there was an, a view that patients who didn't have English as a first language wouldn't like it they love it because they can get their their daughter who's born in this country and speaks fluent English to help uh, to help along the way the two most popular e-consult templates are sexual health and mental health because actually again people prefer to start a journey around mental health in an anonymous uh, online space and it becomes easier so I think it's not completely answered the question but I think I think we've had to move on because I think we couldn't go to a million consultations a day face to face in the midst of a pandemic. And I think we have to redress the balance a bit. I, I, I think that we can't, it, it's not 100% digital because patients have to have the choice to walk in. Clearly they can't walk in off the street at the moment, but have to have a choice to be able to come in uh, to the practice and uh, see a doctor of their choice at the right time. I've got a question on, thank you very much, I've got a question on the chat, shall I uh, read yes. it out? If I read it out loudly, I suspect that everybody will be able to hear me. Or I can um, repeat it for you. It's MacDonald, and she says, thank you very much for coming to York and your thoughtful cloud. lecture. I'm cloud. Cloud. Oh, sorry, Una. <laughs> She's Deep. smiling, she can hear me. Who can see Una? Una, hello. <laughs> She's waving, that's fine, that's good. So her question is, we... Are we training the doctors of tomorrow, the challenges of tomorrow? The answer to that, in general practice or, or across the she, whole way? Dean of the medical school. Una, to unmute, Una okay. unmute. Do you I, mean... I will try and unmute her if I can find her. It's a... Una, yeah. Um, okay, she's got a video on. Ask to unmute. I can ask. Una, I'm unmute yourself. Yeah. Yes, I think I've managed to do that. So I'm no, very, yeah. I've learned something during lockdown. Many congratulations, Claire. Lovely to see you. Um, I, I suppose I'm slightly more interested in medical students. I think probably in second training thereafter, we are beginning to get there. But, you know, we, we, we need to think about the, the, the doctors of 2025, 2020, you know, and beyond. And what is it that they need that we haven't done in the past? Nuna, I suppose I'm going to answer that by saying that every cohort of medical students is taught by trainers who were trained 30 years before. Therefore, we're always teaching out of date. So I was taught by doctors who fought in the first world, in the second world war, sorry, I'm not that old, <laughs> in the second world war, and uh, we're still teaching us, uh, I think, some quite bad habits, uh, like not to respect patients, uh, sort of uh, the idea that, that patients were just coincidental artifacts in in the consultation so i'm not in nothing like that now but the problem is the catch-up i mean to teach the, the students of today we have to be able to predict what's going to happen in the future and we the trainers have to have those skills now it takes no ghost to say that the the medicine of the future is going to probably be three things isn't it it's going to be much more digital it's going to be much more in terms of predictive so uh, personalized medicine genomics and the third one is what I said in my talk, it's going to be much more that we aren't self-sacrificing, that there is a much more healthy uh, relationship between our work and, and ourselves. And I think this is what was lacking in my generation. So, and I suspect yours to a certain extent, you know, you don't look as old as I am. So we 
had to deny our own needs. It was part of our medical training. You, you just did. You did not, you know, so to express vulnerability was seen as weakness. And I discuss in the book that I've written about, and this is an absolute true story. I am the worst person. So I was run over by a, by a bus, a, a lorry on my way between morning and evening surgery. I was knocked off my bike. And my evening surgery was in a different place than morning one. So I wheeled my bike back to the clinic left my bike there, took a taxi to the evening clinic and with great pain and blood, a great pain, continued my evening clinic. Now, I don't think that's going to happen in the future. I think we're teaching doctors to have a much healthier relationship with themselves. And that, I think, is because I was taught by people who modelled that behaviour. So I hope that answers the question to that. But I think it's, it's very difficult. Who would have predicted when I trained that we would have digital revolution and I think mm -hmm. uh, for the GP of the future we're going to have a much more I think there's I, I want to be the first GP to do this by the way so I'm copywriting it I want to be the Twitter GP I want to be a sort of tweet deck GP and do big sessions on, on in, in the big wide world now it's possible you, you know there's lots of hook you know but I'd be interested in you in it but I think unless we get medical students taught by medical students which we can't do because you have all the knowledge we're always lagging behind because we're you were taught by people I suspect who were trained in their you know in, in, in their 80s in the 1980s Is somebody there, sorry. Hello, I'm Nick Bogue at a retired professor of health policy from Imperial College and once described as the father of fun bowling. Uh, I used to have a picture of Nick there. in my bedroom. <laughs> I told him this. I told no, I didn't. He was there to inspire me. He's a fabulous man. His writings were superb. So. Uh, I mean, I think you're quite right about the achievements in the past, and we've got to stress more the massive achievements of general practice and actually saving lives and improving life expectancy. And let's take three examples. Um, smoking cessation has been a GP-driven program. Uh, that's been massively positive over the last 30 years. Secondly, reducing heart disease. Thirdly, controlling diabetes. Uh, we've got to get across that hospitals are a great program, but it is primary care that is absolutely critical, and it's going to be critical in the future because long term conditions are not just about physical symptoms, they're also about cognitive. Nick, I'm, I'm not sure how much of this the Zoom audience will pick up. Yeah. Um, so, so, what Nick is saying is how fabulous GPs are and how sorry, <laughs> and how sorry he is that when he was head of health policy at uh, Imperial, that uh, they and all the other think tanks didn't promote our profession. You have promoted general practice in the future. And Una, actually, if I was to say to you, the GP of the, the, the doctor of the future must not be trained in a hospital because most of the morbidity is in the community. And the idea of, and I always concerned that, for example, a paediatrician, so they're taught to see very sick kids, but they only ever see sick kids or the vast majority. They need to be able to do what we do. And in London, we, I think we see 10 or did do pre-COVID, 10,000 children an hour is to see kids where they're most of them are well and to pick up the, the, the sick ones. So I think you have to turn the whole thing on its head. Nick, was there a question uh, to that though? Uh, the question was, uh, how, how do we get across to the, the people who've got the money and uh, yeah. the wider NHS? Primary care has really delivered and can deliver in the future. But I think it is, uh, the question is, how can we get across that general practice is the best place and the most wonderful profession to be in? But we are, we're a, a problem with general practice is, is that what we do is largely unsung. I mean, how many during COVID, how many of you, how many here as a GP? Right, how often did you have BBC Newsnight into your bedroom to film you doing a, a, a sort of uh, a, a, an e, you know a, a, an e miss list, or to do some telephone ringbacks? No, I can answer. Yet yeah, you know during COVID, it's much more exciting to go to a you know to an intensive care unit and and to see all this heroic work. So what we so we largely it's we're a victim of our own success. What we do is secretly heroic, and. I've given up having to worry about now that we don't get all the press. I think the public, we still come up very high up in, 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 in you know, satisfaction rates, etc. But where I do get concerned 
uh, and I've started to clock it now, and I will always speak up, is when we have policymakers and politicians talking about the NHS and they thank the cancer unit and thank the A&E unit. And, thank, and there's never a mention about general practice. So if I'm in an audience and it, they never mention general practice, I'll put my hand up and say, by the way, you forgot GPs who currently do 70 to 80 percent of all the work done today is done by GP. So um, we do have a belief that we're a national hospital service, not a national health service, but I think it's for us to bring those out. But, you know, as I've grown older, my self-esteem has slightly risen and I've stopped worrying so much. As long as we get the money uh, in order to deliver the services, then I think that's what we should bother about. And it's not heroic stuff we do. We're also easy to blame because if you've got a million consultations per day, something's going to go wrong and therefore it's easy. Whereas you don't have a million consultations, say, in a rheumatology clinic. So. There is another question. How do you inspire the future generation of doctors to choose general practice as a career? Well, uh, it's a very good question. I, I, I think the future doctor sees too many hospitalists and too many narrowists. And uh, by that, I mean a, a super specialist. Uh, and because it's so tough and we're and general practitioners are so good at talking our profession down, you know, why would you join a, a, a job where we're always moaning about things? So I think it's it, it's both exposure to good general practice, it's role models. I think the, the current, uh, all the chairmen we've had, Helen Stoke Lampard was fabulous, Martin Marshall's fabulous, Maureen Baker. I think it's having role models, getting into medical school, as, as I know uh, Helen did, uh, again, talking to medical school, medical school societies. But he, whenever I talk to, to doctors, I just tell them, also anybody, I tell them it's, it's, it's the hidden, it's, we are the secret. It is such a wonderful job. I know there are problems, but I became a dame this morning. I've been picking up emails from patients who have said they remember when I was, I had them in the consulting room, what I did. Now I have any memory, but isn't that wonderful that you make that impact? I got the tube the other day. And this lady came up to me and she said, oh, I used to be your patient. Do you remember? No. Uh, you, you discussed my fibroid. This is outside the tube. And I thought, OK, <laughs> where, where do I go from here? And she proceeded to tell me all about fibroid. My one question I always ask patients when they come up to me after is really, really always ask them. And I say this to the next generation of doctors is, was I kind to you? Because I don't remember. They probably, you know, they, and that to me is the overwhelming so then they i say was i kind to you oh yeah, yeah you absolutely love it and because to me that's the important thing and general practice if you can be kind to your patients the joy that one gets the absolute joy 20 times 30 times a day is, is unbelievable and i don't think there is another profession where you get that joy and the joy of continuity the joy of reassuring an anxious mother about her child's illness, the joy of helping an infertile couple. So I hope that uh, answers the questions. How do you, sorry, Nigel. can you say who, oh Nigel. Yeah, I'm, I'm Nigel Wells. Um, the big thing is, at the minute is north-south divide of COVID, health inequity, health inequalities. How do you think we need to push on that in, in general practice so we don't yeah. Marginalised yeah. certain sectors of the community that can't come to see and, and that is such an important question. question. So the question is about how do we address health inequalities and in particular we've got the north-south divide but I'm not sure it is entirely north-south. I think it's, I think they're inequalities. So I'm, you mentioned that I'm co-chair of the NHS Assembly and the NHS Assembly is about 50 people drawn from right across health and social care, patients, user, carers, people at the top of the profession managers and every time we address the inequalities every, it, it's it's like a stick of rock it's like the the words in a stick of rock because if we don't address the funding issues and of course we used to be able to address the funding issues certainly in primary care then what's the point and if we don't address the inequalities and again uh and not i'm sorry every profession is a fantastic profession but again where the nhs and general practice is so beautiful is that the NHS is beautiful because it's it's based on need and not and not ability to pay. But where GPs are so wonderful is that we can start to address some of these inequalities. We can start to address them in our consulting room, but also 
in our communities and for example the inequalities around morbidity and we know that across the London tube line there was a 15 year health gap but it's tough and uh, I'm not sure we're there at the moment and I think the Covid all pandemics by the way hit the poorest worst whatever pandemic is that the richest can protect themselves to a certain extent but and I think this pandemic we know is hitting the poorest first we know that those with the highest mortality are our bus drivers, our porters, our security guards, our care workers. And, and I think it's up to all of us. Uh, I like to consider, and this is again for the next generation of doctor, I'd like to consider all of us as social entrepreneurs that we are there to change. And what worries me a bit about general practice, which I didn't say, but again, is that we have, we're losing the relationship between our patients in the consulting room and those in our community because we're not living and working probably you do in this lovely area of York but certainly in London we don't and I think we need to find a way of, of capturing that and, and building on it. How do you think talk before you walk initiatives will differ from bread and butter general practice? I don't really understand that. Lorraine can you unmute yourself and tell me talk from what talk before you walk makes me feel like it's it's toast and marmite. I, Yes. Is it the rain, boys? Yes. Yeah. Okay, wait, wait, I will try and. Uh, yeah, I think that's it now. Hi, can I wave at you? Because yeah. I see human so, being. Where are you? Um, I'll put my video on as well. How's that? It's <laughs> lovely to see you. Are you in your? Uh, I'm, yes, I'm in my conservatory. <laughs> It's just a lot of the talk at the moment is around talk before you walk as a way of um, of managing, particularly this winter. Um, and, and my kind of feeling is actually I hear people talk about it and I, and I think, isn't that what we do every day of the week? Um, and I just struggle a bit to find out what the extra bit is like to be. Thank you, Lorraine. I now understand it. This is the digital mantra, talk before you walk. We don't do that. And as I said in my talk, up till before COVID, a patient would see us by either ringing up to make an appointment or go on a telephone triage, which drove us all, you know, awful, or uh, come in and say it's an emergency. So they didn't talk before they walked. They walked in or they dialed in and you, you, you had it on the slot. So what we, what I think, and this refers not just to general practice, but also to accidents emergency. If you put a safe, and I know, by the way, there are other digital front ends, so I'm just going to call it a digital front end, a triage front end. If you put a good digital triage on the front end, then you can start to stream patients. So what you're actually saying is talk all right before you walk, because if you talk before you walk, it's still just as much work to, to, to talk to somebody. So it isn't quite what we do at the moment. I think the GP of the future it's a bit like, uh, you know, when was the last time anybody went into the bank? You, 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 you go and you, you digital before you go in, you digital before you walk. So I, th I don't think it is mainstream general practice, Lorraine, unless your practice is, you know, you've had front ends, digital front ends for ages. Yeah, no, I think it's just the whole concept of triage, I think, which is, seems to be what we're, you know, yes. what we've been told. This is triage. And, and yeah, it, I, I don't think triage. I don't think we, triage, we did. Right. Sorry, I think streaming. I don't like the word triage because it implies it's a very pejorative term that says you're sick and you're not. I think what we're saying is putting people into as, as far as we can, putting somebody into the right place at the right time. We know that the GP doesn't need to see every patient, but in the past, it'd be very difficult to know which patient needs to be seen or not need to be seen unless we saw them all. But yeah. What do you think, Lorraine? Well, I think, I mean, I think that's right. I think it is using the tools, isn't it? It's actually understanding what the tool is there to do. And it is to help with that whole process, isn't it? It's not an alternative. It is yeah. adding information. And particularly in the context of where we are at the moment, it's probably minimising contact, direct contact time by information gathering ahead of it and, and, and yes. make it as streamlined as possible. And where talk before you walk really should come in is, is an accident emergency, which you can put a very robust digital front end. We've done it and it does work. It still doesn't mean a patient cannot walk in off the front door. I, I think the patients still need to have the choice 
when my dog is ill and I adore my dog, even though she's so old, you know, I run to the vet. I just carry her and it's all right. I'm a neurotic dog owner. I think we need to be able to allow people the choice, but put in a very good digital front end, which means that why would you not use a digital front end if you can use, you know, why wouldn't you use it rather like why, why wouldn't you buy? When we used to go on holiday, why wouldn't you buy your, your airline ticket online rather than going into a travel agent if they still exist? Yeah, thank you. Probably got time for one more question if there's one in the room or John Reed has uh, John Reed, yeah. yeah. Sure, should we let John Yeah, Reed yeah get John, John to, to I will un try and unmute you. You can ask it yourself. Okay. Yeah, John Reed. Yeah, yeah. Here's the book, by the way. Down. Down. No, it's not. <laughs> it is oh, upside. Oh, you know why? Inside it's, out. It's, no. No. Mirror. It's mirror. Oh well. Beneath the white coat, doctors, their minds and mental health, all proceeds to charity to support doctors, any doctor and nurses, uh, and to reduce the risk of suicide. Yeah. Exactly. Is John unmuted? There you are. Hi Claire. First of all, congratulations. And and thank you for Thank you for an interesting talk. Um, you say that obviously general practice has been open. Um, the public clearly have um, not felt that, um, sadly, and uh, can be judged by the number of urgent referrals for cancers and um, other urgent problems that there's been a collapse in them. So whilst it may have been open, there's obviously been barriers from their point of view put in the way of their care. Thank you, John, for answering that. I think, and I, I don't like to be critical of the government uh, because I think they're doing their best. I see Stephen Wright laughing. Uh, but I think the protect the NHS slogan was a terrible slogan. The NHS is there to protect patients, not us to protect, uh, not for them uh, to, be, to protect the NHS. And I think what that did was, I, it's not just a criticism of general practice because I think patients themselves were very fearful they, they were very ashamed the ones I saw ashamed of even asking for help because I live and work in the same area I would have patients coming up and asking me whether they should go and have their colonoscopy which they'd waited for for ages for their rectal bleeding and I say yeah they say oh, but I shouldn't be going because I don't want to put you all at risk and so I think uh I think there was a time, wasn't there, when activity dropped considerably, activity in general practice dropped, but now activity levels in general practice, I am told, are higher than they were this time last year, and activity levels in accident emergency departments are about 85% of what they were this time last year, which is probably about the right time. But I can absolutely accept, John, that we have a problem with people delaying coming, and what the mantra now is, help us to help you, help us, by uh, getting a flu jab, following the, the rules, uh, to help you uh, by and you come and present when when you have symptoms, chest pain or a cough. So I think that's the message that we have to go out. So it's not though we got the criticism, and bear in mind, as a GP, you will always get the criticism. Though just it's our cross to bear, just accept it. But they also love us; they love us to bits. But actually, the the mantra of protect the NHS, I think, was the wrong one. I have to say that Claire, I also agree with you saying it's the best job in the world. As a recent, recently or largely retired GP, um, it has been a fantastic um, uh, uh, to offer that sort of service to the community for a long time. It's been absolutely wonderful. That's the message we have to get over. That it's not a. If you get over the hump, which I think is the first two years of general practice when it really is difficult and and you're finding a way and the anxiety levels are high. If we can put the next generation into stable partnerships, whatever that means going forward, it is the most fantastic job in the world. It allowed me to go from mental health, drugs, gambling, homelessness, all sorts of things. Not me personally, by the way, I didn't take drugs. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, the gambling service is for all of England now because it's everything's remote. So if you have any problem gamblers, primary care gambling service, it's a free confidential service, not for doctors, but if you're a doctor gambler, you can come. It's uh, for any patient. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you, Claire. That concludes our oration for 2020. Uh, thank you for your tolerance on Zoom. It, it seems to have worked well. We've had a, a nice live audience here, which I know Claire's been very appreciative of. And she did rashly say at the, uh, as she arrived that um, she would love to come back when we can have a fuller audience. And I'm sure we'd love to have her back at some point. Um, we will, I'm sure we can make reference to her recent, the book that she's just edited. We can put that on our website, I am sure. So I'd like to bring the oration to a close. Thank you. Um, Claire has to get back. She is celebrating with her family. So that takes precedence over any meal that we might have had. Um, apparently she arrived with a bit of a hangover and I'm sure she will also have a bit of a hangover <laughs> tomorrow. Thank you so, so much. Once again, if people can just show their appreciation to Claire for coming here on this special day. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry I we can't eat together.